Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm Mary Fran Johnson, your host and a contributing columnist for CIO.com, where I write about boardroom issues for IT leaders. Twice a month, we produce CIO Leadership Live with the gracious support of CIO.com and our CIO Executive Council. We're streaming live right now onto LinkedIn and Twitter, and we welcome all of our viewers to tap into the conversation with your own questions. One of our editors is watching both streams and will let us know if you have questions directly for my guests today. So let me introduce and welcome our CIO for today's program. He is Nathan Rogers, the Chief Information Officer at SAIC. He became CIO of the $7 billion defense contractor. The SAIC stands for Science Applications International Corp. And he joined them in January of 2019. With more than 25,000 employees, SAIC provides system integration, engineering, and IT solutions across the defense, intelligence, and for civilian agencies as well. As the CIO for the past year, a little bit more than a year now, Nathan has been in charge of IT strategic planning, operations, governance, and cybersecurity. He's also responsible and a big driving force in SAIC's ongoing IT modernization program. And he also provides technical and digital innovation that drives best-in-class customer service. Before his current role, he was the CIO at Angility, which is an engineering services firm that SAIC acquired early last year for about $2.5 billion. And that vaulted SAIC into the position as second largest government services contractor. Nathan's technology and business background includes expertise in diversified IT, financials, shared services, and operational management roles from his time with Angility and before. He and he also served as a director of contract accounting for Northrop Grumman, working in the company's IT sector. Welcome. It's great to have you here today, Nathan. Thanks, Mary Fran. It's an honor to be here. I'm really excited to have a conversation with you. Well, good, because I know from talking to you, uh, getting ready for this interview today, and also just from what I've read about you in the past, that we're going to have a great conversation. Let's start out with the reality that's in our faces right now and update, update us on how things are going for SAIC in the midst of this COVID crisis and what sort of an impact that's had on your job as the CEO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for SAIC, from a macro standpoint, it's been uh, we we've done pretty well getting through this crisis. Uh, we actually had our uh, earnings report uh, last week, and you know we we because we support the DoD, the Intel community, a lot of our government, state and local, we're essential to to keeping things going, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you know to serving and protecting our world. So it's very important that our people are able to work. Um, so so for that, we've been. Very lucky, you know. I know a lot of people out there have been impacted very negatively from COVID and been unable to work. And I, my heart goes out to them. Um, I, we're very fortunate at SAIC; we're able to keep go, doing our jobs day in and day out. So that's good from an SAIC perspective. From uh, how we're dealing with it, it's been a unique experience. We we work with um, a lot of uh, environments where our employees have to go in every day uh, because of the type of work we do uh, with with the federal government. So we've had to be able to support them and, and their needs and safety while still going into an environment, into an office environment. Yeah. Well, half the company has gone and, and started working from home. Yeah. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, the, the everyone's going through, we've heard everyone talk about it. It's been just very quick uh, overnight. Um, and we've been able to do that very well, too. So it's exciting uh, now to think about the future of work um, and, and how to, to move forward. Uh, with COVID, though, I think we've done um, a great job being prepared for an event like this. No one has in their risk management framework, well, companies like this, pandemic, but we do have things like cybersecurity, obviously, and business threats and emerging threats. And I think uh, SAC was well positioned to deal with the pandemic because we had been thinking about our risk management framework, thinking about business continuity, thinking about our resiliency. Mm -hmm. I think really important as CIOs moving forward that we're involved very closely with that risk management framework so that we can continue to influence it 
and think about emerging threats. And sometimes it's, you know, natural threats. Um, you know, it's things you don't think about, but if you can kind of bucket it into this, you know, non-traditional threat idea, um, you can prepare for the next time something you just never would have dreamed up to happen. Let me ask you to talk a little bit more about those, uh, all those thousands of employees of SAIC that actually did have to report to work because yeah. by explaining and saying you're a defense contractor, that doesn't really do justice to the enormous variety of services and jobs that you provide. You mentioned to me, I mean, things involving dolphins, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> Talk yeah, a little more about the side of SAIC that, that our, our listeners maybe have never considered when you just think of the catch-all term of defense contractor. Right. So so a lot of the people that are going into those essential jobs, right, are in that catch-all defense. Um, you know, they're doing system engineering, they're doing IT modernization. You know, we we are, um, for example, we're one of the, the if not the number one IT um, support firm for NASA. Uh, so, you know, so we've got to be there, keep NASA up and running. Now, a lot of those employees were able to work from home um, cause NASA allowed it, yeah. but there's a lot of employees that because of the nature of work, the secrecy of work that we do, um, mm-hmm. they have to go into environments that you can't do from home from obvious reasons. Right. Um, but we do do a lot of SAIC is very, um, very cool company. We have a group that does, um, cognitive performance training, and we actually use that group to create a COVID coping corner, um, on our on our internal site, and it was quickly the number one site being hit by our employees internally, and and these are people that are dealing with folks that are in very stressful situ- situations around the world and helping them um, cope with the the circumstances. And we use that talent that we use with our customers to uh, in this in this pandemic to look internally and and use that same talent talent to help us. Um, so those are the type of, you know, contracts that like that was something I didn't even know about, you know, and, and I was like, wow, that's really cool that we do that. Um, so we have a very wide array of um, work we are able to perform, you know, certainly engineering and IT modernizations, a big part of it, but there's all sorts of um, neat um, projects we do at, at SAIC. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned uh, future of work, and I know that uh, mm-hmm. even- for the pandemic, this was a topic that I had been noting was of increasing interest to CIOs. Mm-hmm. This technology is going to be in the way we use technology and, and its presence in our lives is going to be so much a part of shaping what that experience will be like. Right. One, of the, um, one of the things CIOs have been saying to me about it lately is that, on the, not that there are a huge number of upsides with a pandemic, but one of the possible benefits to come out of this is how quickly this has accelerated acceptance of digital technologies, use of digital technologies. When you think about the future of work now, the way maybe contrast to how you did six months ago, what has changed, do you think? Yeah. You know, what's fascinating, it was actually this time last year I did a um, fireside chat at a uh, conference for, uh, for, for real estate facilities and furniture leaders, <laughs> you know, as an IT guy. Um, and we talked about it, and I talked about then the need for HR, IT, and facilities to really partner up and create these future of work uh, working groups to really think about, you know, what will work be like next year, three years from now, five years from now, and, you know, 10 years from now. And I think it's really important because a lot of the costs in IT and facilities specifically right, is a, in, in HR, they're a huge part of your overhead costs, right? They're huge chunks of money that are spent, especially on, in, in capital. Um, so it's important you got to get years ahead of it as a big company um, to think about these type of things. So in the fall, I actually um, stood up a team uh, partnering with my facilities VP and an HR VP, a team to start talking about the future of work. And we started you know, kind of brainstorming what it's going to be. And I've been putting together a strategical roadmap that's really, you know, taking our back office systems to the cloud and, you know, getting us ready with collaboration and productivity tools to, to embrace this future of work. So whether it's you're in an office space, you're at home or you're at a customer site, how do you bring all those people together when they need to collaborate? You know, and they may be in all three and collaborate virtually, but you might have a conference room with four people in it and the other three people are virtual. 
but you gotta you gotta think about that. And I don't believe it should be driven just by IT. I think having IT facilities and um, HR, you know, tied to the hip with this this vision of future of work is is just critical because it's a cultural thing more than it's going to be technology or the way we do a lay, layout of a facility, right? And HR has to be involved. So HR, you know, has been a tremendous partner. Uh, our CHRO uh, Michelle O'Hara is phenomenal, um, and she is totally on board with our digital journey. She knows where we're headed. And the great thing was we were having these conversations, talking about this culture before COVID hit. So like you said, yeah, you know, people say it's a silver lining. I mean, just through fuel on the fire, we were headed there. Um, but certainly, you know, you know, if we had 15% of our employees working at home and, and we have 50% of our employees after this never go back to the office, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I think um, we're going to see that trend. So now we're talking about how do we take all of our SAIC facilities around the country and make them more open concept, collaborative things where people, when they need to get together and do sprints, for example, or, you know, do a strategic one week, um, you know, how are we going to do, you know, what are we going to do next year type thing, a real strategic meeting or an offsite. We have the facilities, we have the space for them to get together securely. Mm -hmm. um, and when they can work from home and, you know, doing heads down work or use Zoom or, some other, you know, um, capability, then that works too. So, so it's, it's exciting. Well, and you just used the word securely, which actually ties into our, we have our first question from our right. listeners and uh, watchers today. And it has to do with that. And I know this subject is very near and dear to your heart because you're a, you're a defense yeah. contractor. You work in a lot of secure situations. What challenges have you experienced regarding security of employees, home networks? What do you do about that? Yeah, so so we have um, two things. One is we provide endpoints, um, laptops to employees uh, for the most part. So we, again, in the unclassified arena. So those folks can go home and we have secured, they come in through our, you know, our network, right? Through a, um, a VPN tunnel. We also have virtual desktop. So we're able to uh, have employees that are using personal devices come in through through a virtual desktop um, into our data center. So that's where we are today. Um, you know, I think we're going to look at it how this this morphs into the future. But it's really important from a security standpoint, um, especially as a government contractor, that we are secure. Um, we've spent a lot of time over the last two years really. Um, investing in cybersecurity. It's a, it's a, it, it, we brief the board every quarter on it. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a really important topic. Um, funding has been, you know, made available to make sure that we're doing everything we can to be secure. Um, I have an amazing CISO, uh, Alicia Lynch, who works for me, and, and she's really taken us to the next step um, from where we were a couple of years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, We've, we've worked on, I think one of the things that we've done great is we've created what we call a CTIC, a Cyber Threat Intelligence and Integration Center, where we're really able to, you know, you got to do the basic blocking and tackling, but we have a lot of threats that we need to, to deal with too. Um, so it's been pretty exciting um, um, to see how we've evolved the cybersecurity team over the last year. Have you seen a very distinct escalation in that level of threat? Because as you know, most of the world is trying to be kinder and gentler to one yeah. another during a time that is so incredibly difficult in a lot of lives. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily apply to cyber criminals. So yeah. you, you know, is it always bad and getting worse? Or yeah. how do you it's always that? bad, right? I mean, ransomware is just mm -hmm. a multi-billion dollar industry, right? Um, yeah. so it is always getting bad. Um, you know, we certainly the the you know we always have phishing attempts, um, in and you know there's social engineering attempts that continuously happen. I think what's sad is what we're seeing. And the FBI recently posted a warning on this, and and we we helped we helped the FBI with this. Is that we're seeing people, um, you know, interview candidates and say, hey, come work at my company. They interview them. They say, oh, you, well, you need to pay $700. We'll get you set up with all the equipment. And then when you get here, you know, we'll, we'll reimburse you. It's a fake job interview. They're impersonating someone and, and, and they know unemployment's high and it's awful. And that's, you know, that's something um, that's going on right now. Um, and people need to be really careful about it. And, and mm -hmm. you know, we're on LinkedIn, right? You got to be careful about who, who you're connected to and are they a real person? And it's a, 
you know, and I think that's the stuff people really need to watch out for right now. Some of that social engineering. Um, mm-hmm. While I can't as a company necessarily do anything to block that because it's outside of our walls. Um, what we have done is helped our employees be aware of what's going on, you know, encouraging, you know, have multi-factor authentication set up on your personal stuff, you know, be aware of phishing attempts, attempts in your personal life, be aware of the social engineering that's going on on all the social media sites. I mean, still use everything you want to have. I mean, it makes your life easier to use all this technology, but you've got to be really vigilant about what's happening, especially now people take advantage of people when they're down and out of luck. Mm -hmm. Um, They're vulnerable and it's, it's too bad, but, but people need to be aware. That's that's very good advice. And we have an, I don't know how answerable this question is, but very big one. And it's, what do you think the new normal will be? I've, I've had other uh, CIOs that are just referring to it as the new abnormal, because I think all of us are kind of hoping that the situation we have now with the economy just starting to reopen in some state, I'm coming to you from Massachusetts and we are a very cautiously reopening state. It's entirely different when I talk to someone from in Florida or in Arizona. So it's differing all over the place. So when you think about the new normal, uh, do you have any, do you have any brilliant insights on that yet? (laughs) Yeah. Well, hopefully our kids go back to school, but, um, you know, I have an eight and 11 year old, a little eight year old chair behind me. Um, and you know, it, it's, I like working from home and it's great, but I have an eight and 11 year old at home and we're trying to homeschool at the same time. Right. And there's a lot of, you know, parents out there, you have two working parents or you're a single parent. I mean, that is hard. So I hope that's not our new normal, you know, um, but I am worried about that. Like what the schools are going to be like in September. I think about the little guys going in with masks on and, having to sit, you know, in chair in that desk straight all day, six feet away. I mean, that makes me nervous, but, you know, and I draw the a- analogy because you think about how it is in schools, but we're going to experience that same thing potentially if we go back to the office where we have to wear masks, we have to sit in desks that are six feet apart. You can't yeah. put hands like I, it's not a way to, to operate. I think it's very um, uneasing for people, you know, it's not natural. So hopefully, you know, this is a, a period of time, you know, whether it's a year or two years. I mean, I've been advising internally in my company I, and anyone that listens, I think we need to plan for two years. If it ends up being four or five months, mm-hmm. you know, um, but we need to plan for this. And so I do think this working, like we're doing this interview right now, I plan to come to Framingham and do this in person with you. Yeah. I think this is the way we're going to be, but I think the new normal, you know, to me is a couple of years. I, I personally believe Humans have been alive a very long time and they, they like to hug and shake hands and get together. That will happen again. Um, some people are like, oh, you're never going to shake hands again. I'm like, I don't know about that. People are people and, and right. people are going to do it. Yeah. So hopefully it's not too far out, but I'm thinking to, I'm preparing myself and the company for two years. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's very good. And that, I think that's very smart. And it probably- I wasn't necessarily insightful, but... <laughs> I think it was. I've heard a year and a year and a half and probably more of the conservative safer number would be about 24 months. That's what I term the new abnormal, because I'd like to think that this isn't, you know, the way life will be from now on. Related since this topic, another related question, uh, someone and it shows also how alert our uh, our listeners are. And in case you're just tuning in now, uh, you're listening to CIO Leadership Live. And I'm here with Nathan Rogers, who is the CIO at SAIC. And we are talking about all sorts of very interesting COVID aftermath uh, related topics right now. But we'll be getting into other things as well. But the this next question, Nathan, is about with half of your employees eventually coming back into the office, do you have anything to report yet on the kind of things you'll be doing to make them feel safe and to monitor their own wellness? I would imagine probably your, your CHRO would be the one with the most detailed answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we, so we have a COVID task force. We actually meet right now. I'm missing it today, noon every day um, with, um, you know, I have a, I have someone on my team that's full-time business continuity. And then there's someone on our physical security team that's about business resilience and, and dealing with, um, you know, disaster type stuff. And they, you know, they, they've helped lead our organizations through this, but we've been talking about it. We are, like I mentioned, we already have a lot of people going into the office. So we're, we're making sure that their safety is number one, that we give them the right protective gear. 
um, that we have the right spacing in the office. You know, they're safe. But and when you start getting, you know, I, there's a lot of debate on this. When you start getting into monitoring people, you know, I as a CIO get very nervous about having that data. You know, if the data shows up in my system anywhere, I have it. And how do you get rid of it? How do you delete it? Um, so I want to be really, really cautious that if we're going to require in the morning, like you take your temperature, you fill out a questionnaire, and if you get, you know, a red, a red X or something pops up that says, you know what, you shouldn't go to work today. Um, yeah. then, you know, or if you get all green, I, I'm, you know, I, I feel like if we can do something like that and provide that to the employees, um, and they, and each employee feels like every other employee is doing it, that mm-hmm. they'll feel that safety. And I know, um, you know, you've mentioned Massachusetts, you know, I know the gyms and, and some of these other places are starting and dentists are doing that mm-hmm. before you show up. Um, and I think we, we're trying to figure that out without capturing that data in our system, because I just think it's a slippery, slippery slope with PII and um, healthcare data. I just want to be really careful about it while I understand the need to protect our employees. And, and we want to do that and we want to do the right thing. We also need to think long term. Um, we got to be careful about that policing state um, and how that works. So. Well, and I think that that's a, and thank you for such a thoughtful reply to this, because I, I noticed just this week, the CEO of IBM coming out saying, we are not going to get into the facial recognition business. And yeah. I, you know, and he was bringing up all of the issues that that raises. Um, part of it was around the diversity concerns, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in that's Harvard. Right himself. I mean, he is an Indian male. And I was really glad to see that because that's very influential in the tech industry. And the thought that it's artificial intelligence and all of these different systems are good at gathering tons and tons of data. But to ask those questions more in advance, should we have this data? Should we keep this data? Is there some, right. to, you know, flush this data away? Um, and a related, well, I know we're having trouble getting off this topic because the question no, okay. is coming in. Uh, the question now is, since it's not possible to have uh, defense contractors always or everybody working from home, do you see a future where we have an increase in the number of secure locations with smaller numbers of people to help mitigate current or future pandemics or other related challenges? Yeah, that's a hard question. I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I think, you know, there are, um, you know, there's certain customer sites that are, are there for a reason. Um, and it's also not the cheapest thing to do. <laughs> well, so, so I think there's a balance, you know, um, Hopefully, you know, hopefully I, I live another hundred years and uh, there's never a pandemic again. So hopefully this is a one time, but we'll see. I know. It'd be nice if this was a really weird in our lifetimes event. Um, <laughs> and kind of, again, related to that, are there any lessons um, from the current IT based processes due to the COVID, due to COVID, uh, the pandemic, that you think will become permanent processes for SAIC? Does this feel like when we talk about the new normal or the new abnormal, are there things that you're doing differently now that you think may actually become a, a part of the IT process lexicon? Yeah, I, I you know honestly the biggest thing for us uh, from a, just an IT and this is very tactical is, is Zoom. You know the ability you know whether whether your company uses Google Hangouts or Teams or Zoom, you name it. Yeah. This is you know Zooms become you know like you Google it. You know now you you do you Zoom. Um, it's become a word that everyone uses. And I think that lexicon and the way we do this in, in our environment is here to stay, um, where it wasn't necessarily frequent. Um, so I do think this is this part of the technology, and I'm not sure I'm answering this question right, you know, it's kind of tactical, but this is a lasting part. And one of the things I, um, I don't live near our headquarters, I fly down there a lot. You mm-hmm. know, I What's exciting to me, you know, if my CEO is listening, she'll laugh. But what's exciting to me is that hopefully in the future, when we do leadership meetings, we don't always have to be in person. You know, we can do a meeting this way, and because leaders are at different sites, even even near the headquarters, and all not all in the headquarters, that we can do a good strategic meeting that might only lead, last an hour or two mm-hmm. um, via virtual, and we don't feel like we always have to be in person. I do think that. They, everyone's now become so comfortable with this technology because not only are they doing it at work, they're doing it with their parents or their kids or, you know, friends. It's becoming natural. And I think that, um, 
you know, if there's anyone out there listening from the airline industry, I definitely worry about the airline miles going down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I would also say, you know, you kind of get the, you know, depending on where you stand on climate change, it's a side benefit of all this too. You know, I think a lot of people will maybe reduce their commutes into the office. They'll reduce, you know, their, their flying. Um, so it's, that's going to be a lasting effect of this too, that I'm not sure. Um, I know people are talking about it, but it'll be interesting to see how that, that shapes out. Yes. Well, and I, I think that's actually a really good point too about the virtual meetings and how much more comfortable they're getting. I, in the column that I write about boardroom issues, I've been talking with more board members and former CIOs who are now serving on boards. And uh, to a person, they have all now taken part in something they never thought would happen, which yeah. was a virtual boardroom meeting. Yep. They're finding that they are just as productive, if not more so. Yeah. I mean, it helps that they already know each other as a group. It's a very collegial kind of atmosphere and everybody has adjusted. And, yeah. you know, talking about also, you know, people in their 60s and 70s who maybe yeah. thought in their lives, would they be doing a virtual board meeting? Yeah. And they do after they've done one or two, they're like, well, you know, this is great. We don't have to go to Cleveland right. in February. Right. <laughs> No, that so I'm on the board of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, and we had our first Zoom board meeting a couple of weeks ago. It was a full Friday and, and half a Saturday. You know, it went really well. You know, we took a two hour break in the middle of the day on Friday um, for walk, eat, lunch, which I think is important. I think if you try to Zoom for nine, 10 hours in a row, <laughs> your head will explode. But uh, taking a break, and I would encourage everyone, like, take a break in the middle of the day and get some fresh air, but um, especially during the summer. But we, um, you know, it went well. I could see, you know, I can definitely see board meetings, you know, being virtual, you know, once or twice a year. I think the in-person is, like I said, I think people need that contact. Um, you make a relationships over, you know, the small talk outside of the formal meeting, especially boards where the meetings are so formal. I think there's a lot of benefit to that. Yeah. Um, so, but I think it could be a mixture and it'll save, you know, costs and um and and it'll take stress off of people having to travel all over the world too well and i've uh, i've got a lot of other topics i think we'll yeah. inch our way off of uh <laughs> pandemic and the, all the COVID. Yeah. <laughs> um but uh it, my next question is actually about uh customers and journey mapping and that sort of thing but i'm i don't know i'm also drawn to the idea of talking a little bit more about what all this is for diversity and inclusion because yeah. of all of the very disturbing and very affecting yep. uh, are happening all around us with demonstrations for racial justice and all that. And I know just from talking with you ahead of time, this is a subject you've thought about uh, deeply. And so let's dive into that before we sure. get before we get more technical about, you know, your plans for technology next year. And that's yeah. What uh, what what are your thoughts on all that right now? Well, you know, you you mentioned um, doing facial recognition, right, as a as an issue. So I do think, while you know, you, you know, maybe there's folks in IT that don't think about di diversity this way, way. I'm hoping, you know, the c people start communicating more openly and honestly. But it's very very important that we um, have this conversation right now. I, I think it's a it's the you know if you haven't had it before in your company or your organization now is the time to talk about diversity and specifically about race. I think it's a very, very hard conversation. It's very difficult. Um, so, you know, at SAC, we've done a phenomenal job, you know, um, in all sorts of areas. You know, we have a multicultural group. We have a Connect and Grow, which used to be the millennials, but I didn't like that. You know, we didn't like that term per se. The millennials don't like that term. So we, we um, you know, create a Connect and Grow group to help young professionals. You know, we have um, um, an equality group. We have a, uh, you know, a women's, and, uh, a women's group and a STEM group and a veterans group. So we have BRGs and, and we've done a great job with those BRGs, um, bringing awareness to diversity, encouraging diversity. And, and I think it shows as a Fortune 500 company, we have one of 37 female CEOs with Nozick, which is great. And our board is 50% female too, which I think is... Mm -hmm. you know, the only, it's one of, you know, few um, Fortune 500 companies. So we've done a really good job at the leadership level there. And I think we need to put that same attention, um, you know, at, at, at SAIC, but also, you know, everyone in all your companies, you know, around race and, and have the hard conversation. Um, 
you know, it's, it, you know you, it's justice, e- equity, diversity, and inclusion. And mm-hmm. you know, standing up a task force or um, having the business resource groups or whatever, organ- you know, however you want to organize internally to have those conversations, come up with ideas, and, and don't be on the sidelines. Um, you know, get in the game and talk. And, and hopefully it's not just talk. You come up with actions, too. And how do we improve? But as IT people, I think one of the things that we really need to think hard about is that this is a systemic issue. No one themselves thinks they're a racist. Like no one's like, I'm a racist, right? That's not, that's not the way it is. It's a systemic issue. So you have to, you have to get in there and, and look at the biases in the system that has been there forever. And as IT people, we talk about, right? People, process, and technology all the time. And those people, process, and technology have biases that were not purposely necessarily put in there, but mm-hmm. it's big purpose to get them out. And that is where you have, it's not just going to go away because the younger generations don't think that way. It will take purpose to get these biases out of the system. Yeah. As IT people, we're, we're very much part of the system and people process in technology and tools, right? We help put those in, we help guide, we have got to help untangle this and we have these conversations. And, um, you know, it, it's it's a hard one. But I think that's what we're seeing with all the protests. Like, it's not just about, you know, it, you want to be empathetic. You want to listen. That's step one. But you also need to take action. And, and it's very, you know, it's little, little by little. But we all have to do our part. We can't be like, oh, I, well, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not part of the problem. We, we're all part of the system together as, a, as a, you know, as Americans. And as Americans, we need to step up and and do, you know, do the right thing and really, really think about this and and talk about it. Yes. Well, I I agree. And I think that it is no one, it's a very shameful thought if someone thinks about, you know, their internal, if they have thoughts that would be labeled as racist or are racist, and no one would want to admit that. But the fact is that a lot of policies and things that have started out and established in our societies have had that effect. And yeah. it's I've been listening to more and more discussions about this, and it's a, a broader way of thinking about it that I think enables right. all of us to talk more about it, to just recognize some of these biases. And I, I think in a lot of the I, I like the fact that diversity and inclusion is talked about now. It's not just about checking yeah. a box and saying, OK, we've got a Latinx and we've got a, a person of color and we've got a woman. Right this committee, that it's more about that overall feeling of inclusion around the table. Yeah. The ways to get to that. And of course, this shows my bias for conversation, but I always think that once you start talking about something uh, you learn from listening, it's better and it's better for our brains, certainly probably better for our brains than being on too many video conference calls in a day. (laughs) True. Yeah. I think, I think the listening, sorry to jump in, Mary, it's just such an important topic. I'm passionate about it too. I think the listening is huge. And I think when we get to the point of action and you, you know, I, I, I personally want to have diversity on my team. Mm-hmm. I, I talked to a really good friend this past weekend and he said, you know, once you get to that point of having diversity on the team, that's critical. But then you have to, how do you get people to speak up and you listen to the diverse thought, right? It's not just checking a box, right? That's one, you know, you kind of a step there, but that next step, how do you make sure inclusion is really working? Yeah. I think that that's yeah. the part um, that, you know, and hopefully we'll just see a lot more progress on that over the next year. Yeah. Yes. So yep. Related to segue to another set of questions. And we've got to really, I feel like our audience is guiding us much more than I am. <laughs> often do you meet your business leaders, employees, or customers? And when you get together, do you talk about innovation? So okay. let's, let us pivot over to thinking okay. about customer journeys and innovation and uh, what your guidance or ideas are on that. Yeah. So, so internally, um, you know, I've definitely pushing my own team. So I have about 400 people in it at this point. Um, And I'll just give you guys an example. We um, from an innovative, right. We met in an offsite last October and we tried to come up with a couple, two ideas that we said, you know, are, are, innovative and will we'll really change things. We talked about how we had this employee workflow course that was all over the country and um, at customer sites at home and in the office, right? So again, before the pandemic even hit. 
And we talked about how do we get them to collaborate more because everyone was talking about this collaboration. And we um, came up with Project Unicorn. And the point of Project Unicorn was to figure out a way to improve the collaboration of our employees. So we went through a whole process and RFP and, you know, we, we're, you know, we're still working through this process, but looking at tools again, like, you know, Zoom teams and, and others um, and, and, you know, other uh, soft phones and, and video conferencing, but really looking at how to collaborate. So it's not, so we're being innovative, but we're not, we're not sitting down with a bunch of developers and building a product, right? We're being innovative on how we can improve collaboration at the company and we kind of set an ambitious goal um, to relook at the technology around this. Um, I think some of the innovative things that we're doing beyond that, that's one example, is I have a um, what, we, what we call customer zero. So we work very closely with our CTO and our solutions technology group to look at what they are delivering to the, our end customers. So for example, we're working on a chat bot for the help desk, and hopefully we can expand it beyond IT help desk to you know, HR, payroll, and other types of help desk too. Um, so we're looking at that chat bot, and we're building it, and IT is investing the time and money to get it built for SAIC with the hopes that we would then add it on to our offering, on our help desk offering that we give to our customers. Okay. okay we're being innovative. Um, and then there's also things that, other examples where we'll, we'll help partner again with, with our folks that are working on the customer to develop a solution or to test a solution and get it to a point where we can use it internally and then go out and sell it. And I think that's really important. So I meet um, frequently within my team, frequently across the company. I also meet with my peers and talk about innovation. I, I, I attended a great um, innovation um, session at MIT Lincoln Labs uh, before the pandemic started, um, which was fantastic. Um, and, and that was a whole night of talking about innovation. And, you know, and I think with our customers, we certainly are constantly trying to listen to their needs and what they, what they desire so that we can be innovative. And right now, the hot topic is IT modernization, you know, the future of work and how the, what are they going to do, right? I mean, that's the hot topic. Well, because you really can't engage in any kind of digital transformation without having an entirely modernized foundation and infrastructure. It, mm -hmm. it used to be something CIOs would talk about it as the, the part of the iceberg under the water. You know, the right. part that nobody wanted to, everybody wanted to focus on the above the water part, which is, you know, all sunny with snow and polar bears and everything. <laughs> Iceberg is beautiful, but underneath, not so much. And of course, yeah. North Panel IT. Uh, and I, IT modernization seems like a much uh, topic that's getting a lot more air and sunshine these days, especially as companies realize how much they really need to catch up. And that's, uh, again, one of those silver linings I keep seeing and hearing about is the way so many of these plans have continued to accelerate, even when companies are, are yeah. in you know, some fairly dire financial straits in some industries. Um, related to that, to the idea of innovation, one of the kind of famous ways for IT people to be more innovative is to take part in those design thinking workshops. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you been able to, in a remote or in a virtual way, been able to keep that kind of work going in any way over the last couple of months or are things yeah. sort of on a pause where we figure out what the next normal will look like? Yeah. No, we, you know, we, when I came into SIC, we kind of started talking about this digital journey. And I know digital is a CIO buzzword to a certain mm -hmm. degree. We started talking about what this meant for um, SIC internally, because we're certainly helping our customers um, mm -hmm. become more digital as well. So, uh, so we started that conversation. We started building our digital roadmap. And what, what I've been doing in the last couple of months is actually really documenting our digital strategy, getting our roadmap more mature. Um, talking about the strategy and really starting to get to the point where we want to get down to, you know, um, individual contributors and managers and talk about what does this mean for you and your team? Where, where does this take you and how can you evolve and become better at what you do? So, so we've been having these conversations and we had a digital strategy workshop via Zoom. Um, you know, it went great. Um, we had consultants that led it. I got people in San Diego, Orlando, Virginia, New Hampshire, and we're all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a great conversation um, and really were able to articulate what our definition of it digital was, um, how we thought 
us as the IT department could really contribute to the SAIC um, and the digital strategy of SAIC. Um, we're conducting interviews with leaders across the company, um, all via you know this this avenue, um, just to make sure that we're all aligned and it makes sense and everyone's on the same page. And I even briefed. Um, I had a VP offsite, and we used a, a tool to do because um, uh, our offsite was supposed to be in person. So we retooled it, and we did a VP offsite. So it was about 150 VPs there, and we had a great. I thought it went great. We were able to, everyone was in their houses, you know, and we were able to have, um, you know, a, the, the presentations, a keynote, um, you know, speakers, a panel at the end with, pan, you know, questions coming in. Um, you know, there's a lot you can do with the technology during now. And I don't think just because you're, you're um, at home, the innovation stops. You can certainly do this. You know, a lot of people are used to probably having scrum teams, pods where they're in a room with white there's digital whiteboards you know we're, we're trying to figure that out right now how to get digital whiteboards i mean that stuff exists so i do think that just because you've gone into this environment as long as you can do it securely i'll go back to that <laughs> you work in this environment you know just make sure what you're doing is secure well and that's the, those are all really great points and one of the things that i've heard very reliably from a lot of my cio friends recently is not only how pleasantly surprised they've been at their <laughs> to keep up yeah. the meetings, but everybody's been talking about greater productivity. And once you get your home office up and running and set up, um, I, I know that uh, what you said about how probably 50% of the people that didn't used to work at home probably will going forward for a while now. I think that yeah. that is probably going to be fairly industry-wide across a whole bunch of different industries. And it's the, the, that's one of the great accelerations I think that's been happening with all of this. Um, I think Mary Fran with the productivity question, as you're looking at the, uh, for you, the questions that are coming in on the productivity point, just to point that out, you know, I've, I've been um, doing, you know, a lot of conversations around this. And every time I talk to people about, are you more productive? They always say yes, but they caveat it with they're working more hours. So my question, I, I think for all the listeners, right. Are you more productive one to four on Wednesday? Ask yourself that. Is yeah. your team more productive from one to four on Wednesday? The, the hours you always work, you know? Um, and, and when I ask the question that way, I still get same or more. I, didn't, I never get less. Um, so I, I find that fascinating. But I think you have to caveat because everyone always says, well, I'm working more hours. I roll out of bed. I work until I go to bed. <laughs> you know, I, hopefully people are, are getting out of that. But. <laughs> Well, I was questioning myself uh, early on with this and continue to whether the work-life balance that we were all so fond of talking about and aiming, yeah. whether that got completely thrown out of whack by all of this. And, and of course, uh, you mentioned it too, that exhaustion factor of being on too many video conferencing meetings during the day, because it's actually difficult for our brains uh, to concentrate on that. I have yes. a, um, a podcast that I started doing uh, for CIO.com back in March. And one of my recent, the, the one that makes its debut next Monday uh, is a friend of mine, an executive recruiter named Kristen Lamoureux. And she and I are talking about doing virtual job interviews. Yeah. And I, you know, one of the first things she recommends to people is how the green dot is your friend. And you and I are both doing that right now. We're trying to focus as much as we can on that green dot. Because if you look at the face on your screen, you're actually looking down and, yeah. you know, that tells your brain a different message and all. But it well, also hopefully your face isn't too far away. It's about three inches from my thing and I am looking at your face, but... <laughs> I know. It's just, I feel, I often ask when I get off of these, I'll, I'll ask our, our um, video conferencing experts, I say, did I look cross-eyed at a certain Because <laughs> yeah. I yeah. felt like I was looking at that green dot so much. Um, we have another question here, and this is actually related to whether it's easier to get a security program going in current circumstances than under normal conditions where it might be easier to get a coalition of business leaders together on security. I'm, I, I don't know, for a, a company in the defense contractor industry, that's probably never been a terribly hard sell for you. Have you seen any difference in you know the conversations you're having about security and getting the resources you need? Yeah. Um, I think you'd be surprised. It's still a hard sell. You know, you, spending money, spending money. Um, Good. So, no, cybersecurity is always something that, um, you know, it always feels like you're limiting people's functionality the more you lock things down. Mm -hmm. Because 
want to do what they do in their personal lives and not that what they're doing in their personal lives is secure. And I, you know, again, I, people be careful, but um, so we do, you know, have those conversations a lot. And, and, and it's something that is, um, you know, definitely a hard conversation because there are times where people are like, well, it's harder to get in. It, the functionality is harder. Why do I need to have MFA on my cell phone? You know, I think mm -hmm. those conversations are always hard. Um, we have, you know, with COVID, I, I, I don't know if it's changed tremendously for us because I think we did a lot of these things before we got here. Um, so it'll be interesting next time something new comes up. Uh, but because of all the work we did over the last year, it allowed us to flip the switch and go home very quickly. Um, had we not done everything we did over the last year to really secure our environment, I think this would have been a harder flip to switch, a switch to flip. Uh, there's a, there's a huge contrast between companies that started two or three years ago working on security and digital transformation and putting yeah. some of those modern technologies and the companies where CIOs were still struggling to get the funds. And yeah. it, I agree. It's a huge, it's a, a real, it's a real black and white scenario in terms of which ones I think will be most successful going forward. I want to, um, I, I want to grab into our, our remaining 15 minutes. And if you have just joined us, you're watching CIO Leadership Live. I'm Mary Fran Johnson. I'm here talking with Nathan Rogers, who is CIO at SAIC, the second largest defense contractor in the United States. And we're going to talk now about some of your big business and tech initiatives coming in the next year or so. And I know that you are, uh, I've read articles where you have been holding forth on IT strategy. So I know that you didn't, you didn't come into your CIO position uh, over a year ago with no plan in mind. So uh, talk about the IT strategy and what, if anything, has shifted in terms of the importance that you've, in terms of the importance ranking of your business and tech initiatives going into yeah. 2020 and 2021. Yeah. So when I came in, I mean, I, I always do a hundred day plan and I've had a couple separate articles on that um, as well. Um, and I think as part of that 100 day plan, part of it is setting that strategy. And I'm a big believer in that one page strategy followed by a roadmap that kind of shows where we're headed and really tying our key enablers in IT to the business drivers. So what, what is going to drive the bit and not just saying, you know, row revenue, right? Really, you know, what inspire our employees, you know, guide growth and BD excellence, whatever those key enablers of your business are. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we've spent a lot of time building out that strategy, getting buy-in across all the executive team, across my peers, my my leadership team, and my team and, and individual contributors in IT as well, to make sure that we have the 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 right um, priorities set out, and we're looking out. You know, I, I have trouble looking. Some people say I have a five-year plan. I think in IT it's really hard to look out five years. So, you know, I tend to be two to three years out, um, but really, eighteen months is what you know is being actionable right now, and. We've set that strategy, and last year was very much, I think, about embracing it. Mm -hmm. um, we we're integrating two multi-billion-dollar companies. By the way, we're not the second largest defense contractor. Um, system integrator, maybe. <laughs> Just to put the point that out there. Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman, they're really big too, but, but we're a big company. So, but as a big company, making sure that you know seven and a half billion dollars worth of revenue on the same page is is really important. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the thing I show every time I present to the executives. It's like a broken record. I feel like. When I, when I feel like I'm repeating myself, I'm hoping people are hearing it for the first time. So, um, so I do show that strategy. The, the other part of it um, with, with the environment now, because we were making this digital shift, you know, as, as long as I can remember, one of the reasons I'm brought in is because I do have a finance and business background. So I'm, you know, I'm always cutting costs. And it's not just about labor. Two-thirds of IT is non-labor, right? So negotiating better deals, getting better partnerships with vendors, you know, all sorts of stuff. But as you modernize, right, just Moore's law, as you modernize, you, 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 you cut, you're able to save money and bring better uh, technology, better functionality, right, better business value. And so, so we, as we set out on this digital journey, I think now with COVID, the, the executive team definitely sees it. And for the first time ever, like I've always been cut, 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 cut we got investment. So we got investment to make sure that we fulfill our strategy. So not only do I was comfortable already that everyone's bought into the strategy, you know, but just a little, even though it's just a little bit, it just 
gives you know credence to what we're doing is right and it's going to help the business. Um, and that, that's something I'm really proud of because that's something, you know, I've been doing this for a while, <laughs> running large teams. And it's not often someone's like, we want to give you more money to get your stuff done. So as a, as a IT, you know, for the CTOs and digital officers and stuff, they probably have different experiences. But CIOs, I'm sure many out there agree, you know, we're asked to cut a lot. Well, and, and I know so many CIOs who are very focused on operational efficiency because... Yeah. And they are able to save money in a certain area. They're also able, if they've got a cooperative CEO, to squirrel it away and invest it yeah. in, in uh, innovation in other areas. Yep. It's just like the the argument that this is really going to be a direct benefit on the front line to our customers and clients is a much stronger business argument yeah. than to say how great it would be to have the next upgrade of whatever. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, your business background actually is quite strong. Uh, it goes back to third grade, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my paper out. Your yeah. paper out. I've always had a desire to make money. I don't know. Yeah. It's it's nothing to be ashamed of in technology if you're a little <laughs> focused. It's something we've been encouraging in technology leaders for years and years. Yeah. Um, how do you think that passion to understand the business you're in um, and uh, Let's segue in our, our last 10 minutes here yeah. to think more specifically about leadership and advice to aspiring CIOs or even some of your colleagues mm -hmm. about the ways that you have, have applied this, you know, entrepreneurial thinking uh, to your own leadership and the kind of things that have become important to you over time in terms of guiding the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I, um, yeah, leadership such a big topic, right? Yes. Um, Lot to it. But I think, you know, for me, um, there's, a, there's a few aspects. One, you know, I have learned, um, you know, the importance of kind of having family first. You know, I'm, I'm very big. I think, you know, it comes down to people and, you know, um, employees and, and us as colleagues. Like, you, you got you to gotta be happy with your, your family part because uh, it, it leads into work, right? So I think the family first, and we talked about the work-life balance, and it's hard right now for sure, but it's a huge part. Um, you know, and I kind of, from there, I, I always think team, customer, I added, I started thinking community quite a bit over the last couple of years and then myself, you know, and that order can change depending on the week and the priorities. Um, right. so, so I find those all very important with the team part of it, just to go to that, you know, I've always been a believer in trying to, um, get everyone around one goal. So I'm a big Patrick Lencioni fan, um, for those who have read Patrick Lencioni. Um, so he calls it a rallying cry. I call it a war cry. No, I've been doing Warcry since 2006. I've never come up with something as cool as freedom and running down a field, but, you know, <laughs> for, for the Braveheart fans. So, um, yes. but I, uh, you know, uh, but we um, certainly, um, I, I always have a Warcry and it may be six to nine months long. And it's something that everyone can get behind in the organization and mm -hmm. really embrace. And then from there, whether you call it defining objectives or OKRs, you know, so like, Google uses OKRs, the John Doerr OKRs, um, mm -hmm. objectives and key results. So whether you use either of those models, they both work, but I think having that rallying cry with your team and being passionate about it and, and, and portraying that vision and having it short term uh, is huge because it gets everyone on the same page towards a, you know, a shorter term initiative that you can call success or failure, but I like to win, so I'll say success. Um, so you can call success at the end and um, I think that from a team perspective, I have been doing that for a long time. Um, it's something I, I'm passionate about. I find it to be very important. But like I said, with leadership, I think there's so much to it. I think how you invest in your people, how you grow um, teams, how you, you know, encourage people to grow in their own careers, whether it's within your organization or rotating or, you know, sometimes people have to leave the company because they have aspirations that don't fit, but you want them to be support, you know, you want to support them in their personal lives. In their career aspirations. So it's just really important to, um, you know, be people first, uh, you know, before the technology part of being a CIO. Mm -hmm. Well, and you'd mentioned too, when we spoke that um, mentoring is also just yeah. a really important part of the way you think about leadership. And I actually like the way you renamed a group that millennials has become one of those kind of slap on the face labels for yeah of people in their 20s and, and early 30s. And I, I like Connect and Grow much better. Yeah. Yeah. As the executive sponsor of Connect and Grow, one of the things we're working on 
is putting a mentoring program in place. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like to call it, um, I think it was Chip Daly that I heard speak um, from Airbnb. He called it a mutual mentorship, which I love. Because yeah. you can cross generational, have mentorships, and whether you're in your 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, 20s, whatever it is, if you can you know, have a mentorship with someone in a different decade, it goes both ways. Mm-hmm. And having that relationship, someone you can talk to um, and understand, you know, their perspective, you know, it goes back to what we were talking about with DNI. It's the same thing here from a generational standpoint. How do you understand someone else with a diverse set of thinking? Um, and, and it goes both ways and you can really learn from each other in that mentorship. And, and I love that because it's, it gets away from the classic mentor mentee, um, something we're working on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working on it personally with someone and then I'm trying to, with the company, ideally get something like that going. Mm-hmm. Well, and I thought when we were talking about this earlier and uh, you were saying that, you know, the, the leading with your heart as well was something that oh, yeah. you're working on. You'd mentioned that you've been writing a weekly letter to your team. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stay at home. Stay at home CIO. Although I got to admit, I haven't written like two weeks. I keep thinking about it. I have something drafted. I got to get it out. But yeah, I've been writing, uh, you know, notes from a stay at home CIO um, to, my, to my leadership, to all the managers in my team, and, and they're welcome to share it. Um, and yeah. the topics have ranged. I, I started off with um, end of the world books that I'm a big fan of. I like dystopias, which, you know, I figure I might offend some people, but <laughs> yeah, it was funny. <laughs> Watching that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I talked about all the, I, I, I'm somehow, my, my parents call me Mr. Destructive. I, I, I constantly hurt myself. So um, I've had many injuries. So trying to keep it personal, but I've also shared things like, um, you know, information on our financials or our purpose statement um, that mm-hmm. rolled out a new purpose statement at SAIC. Um, so I try to, you know, be light and be personal. I think I call it, you know, it's encourage. I, so you and I talked about it, it's encouraging the heart um, yeah. it's that I, I, I don't know if it was Myers-Briggs or something, but mm-hmm. here, it was my weakest point and something I've always kept in mind that I got to work on. But right. I believe you really have to share what's going on personally. You know, mm-hmm. I met my eight and 11 year old today, right? You got to constantly share what's happening to you personally. And, yeah. um, and you got to listen to um, your teammates on what's happening in their lives. And I think that it's a really, that encouraging the heart part of leadership is, is really critical. It's something that's easy to forget. I love talking about work. I could talk about work all day that, yeah. that's for me. Yes. Um, it's really important to also, you know, talk to people person to person, you know, uh, relationships before tasks. I heard someone say that recently, and I think that holds true. I, well, that, and that, that's a, a great observation. And I've talked with over the years, there's, uh, it, it is, I think it's finally come very much into vogue now for soft skills to be just as important as the hard skills. Because I've had yeah. so many CIOs tell me that technology is easy. It's people that are hard. Yeah. yeah. If you're just always t- a business first, let's just talk about the bottom line kind of approach. Uh, it just, it's such a, a one dimensional way to look at leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm always uh, really encouraged when I hear CIOs like you talking about uh, all of these kind of issues around leadership. Uh, it makes me glad that you decided to go into being an IT leader rather than the CEO of a startup. <laughs> So let me see the very um, the very last question we have from our audience, and it gets back to you know it's more the hard skill than the soft skill. Wondering if you had to adjust top line or bottom line financial outlooks for your own budget in 2020 or 2021. We are we are ending on a hard skill question. Yeah. No, you know I I mean I don't know if the question is related directly to the pandemic. So no, not because of the pandemic per se. I mean I'm certainly being super careful right now. Yeah. Um, not to spend um, frivolously. I never do, but I'm being very, very careful. Um, you know, cutting travel and things that you know we're not doing right now. So it's very easy to cut some, you know, get some savings out of that. Um, but no, I've been going through a big savings exercise for the last couple of years because we um, integrated uh, Agility and SAIC. Uh, so a big part of our story were the synergies. You know, no one ever wants to hear that word. It's cost cutting. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're integrating Unisys Federal right now, which a lot less of that, that's much more about the value add, not the synergies, but it's really important that, um, 
we control our costs and, you know, we, we increase um, EBITDA or we increase the bottom line as we bring these companies together, you know, there's clearly value to be gained and, and business to win. Uh, but the, the controlling as a contractor, government contractor, controlling our costs is, is critical. Um, so we are very, very, um, you know, really conscientious about constantly uh, reducing our costs wherever we can. Um, but with these recent deals, it's been part of our, um, you know, our, our deal um, thesis that we, we wanted to create synergy and, and improve the bottom line. So, yes, I've been very focused on it, but not because of the pandemic. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Well, that was a great answer in a whole lineup of great answers. Thank <laughs> you so much for um, doing such a great job fielding all of the questions to our very avid listeners and watchers today. And just thank you, Nathan, for joining us. It's been wonderful having you on here. Thank you, Mary Fran. This has been a lot of fun. It, it really has. And didn't I promise you it would be? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's great. Power <laughs> fly by and it really has. So if you joined us late for this wonderful conversation with Nathan, Nathan Rogers, CIO of SAIC, please know, uh, do not despair. You can watch the full episode just a few hours from now on CIO.com or on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel called IDG Tech Talk, and I would recommend that you take a moment to go and sign up for that. You will also be able to catch our entire conversation as an audio podcast. If you go to your favorite podcast player and just type in CIO Leadership Live, you will find 40-something conversations just like this, and the most recent one will be with our, our latest guest, Nathan Rogers. I hope you enjoyed the conversation today as much as I did. I'm inclined to think you all did because we had so many questions. I actually had a little bit of a hard time getting my own questions in. And I hope you will join us for the next episode of CIO Leadership Live, which will be on Monday, June 22nd at 12 noon Eastern. And I will be talking with Brad Clay, who is the CIO at Lexmark. Thanks so much for tuning in today and stay safe and well out there and we'll see you again here next time.